My name is Matthew Christian. I'm the Associate Dean for Division Initiatives and Faculty Affairs here in the Division of the Social Sciences. This is an exciting session, really at the core of who we are as a university, as an urban university rooted in Chicago. This has been the home to many of the, of the greatest innovations in social research in cities, ranging from the, the School of Social Service Administration, which has been around for more than 100 years and was the first such school in the world, but also the home of the field of urban sociology. Um, before I introduce our panelists, I also want to point out one of our graduate students who's here today, uh, Jason Radford. Jason's going to be out. <laughs> Jason will be out in the lobby afterwards, showing you another aspect of the work that's going on here. He's one of the leaders of our computational social sciences group, and will have uh, demonstrations of what he and his colleagues are doing with computational data to look at urban research. And I think our faculty are fabulous, but our, our PhD students really are, you know, where things are going if we're going to talk about 21st century social scientists. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, our three panelists. Uh, immediately next to me here is Dean Mario Small. He's a professor of sociology. Next we have Neil Guterman, uh, dean of the social Service School of Social Service Administration. And then next to him is Kate Cagney, professor of sociology and director of the Population Research Center. So each of them will say a few words, but then ultimately the goal is for all of you to come into conversation as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, uh, welcome, all of you. Uh, I'm Mario Small, as uh, you heard from Matthew. Uh, we're, uh, uh, the three of us have convened uh, and we've decided to make sure that we really take advantage of this opportunity uh, for you and to give you a chance to talk and ask and converse as much as possible. So we're going to keep our, minute, our comments very brief to about six or seven minutes, seven and a half uh, each, uh, and then give you a lot of time to, yeah, five and a half at this point, give you a lot of chance to talk. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to give you a sense of what is going on in the university with respect to the urban social, what we're calling urban social science, very broadly defined. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the big picture in terms of what we are envisioning to do uh, in the university. Uh, Neil is going to talk a little bit about uh, the School of Social Service Administration and its role in this work. And Kate is going to uh, uh, narrow down even further into one of the really interesting and exciting projects taking place at the university right now that's bringing uh, both research and practice together. So as you all know, uh, the University of Chicago has a tradition of being uh, one of the most important sites for urban social science research and practice in some respects, but certainly research. Uh, the tradition in American sociology certainly of uh, urban social science really began here. Uh, many of the most important works in that work uh, in, that, in that body of literature have actually been produced by people who at one point in their careers have had an office in this building. Um, the way we're thinking about this project is to think about that tradition and recharging it for something that's happening today. If you look at uh, the world today, as of two years ago, more than half of the world population has become urbanized for the first time in history. That uh, as if United Nations projections are borne out, by the middle of this century, something like 70% of the world population will be residing in cities. One way of thinking about this is that over the 21st century, the world will be an urban world. And to that extent, a lot of social science really will be urban social science. The question is, how, do, how does the University of Chicago take this idea, take this fact, take this changing world, and generate a new, a new generation of social science thinking that responds to new conditions, that, uh, that is informing the world in a way we inform social science and inform, uh, practice uh, around urban issues in the past century, but is not mired, is not trapped in 20th century thinking. What we're doing is we're generating an institute, and this is a work in progress, and Neil and I have been working actually pretty, quite actively on this, even this morning, uh, we're working on an institute whose aim would be uh, Institute for the Urban Science and Practice is the, is the, is the title that we have at the moment, whose, whose aim will be to generate, uh, first, to set the agenda for urban social science for the coming century, 
The second, to encourage and promote a holistic approach to social science research that involves multiple disciplines working in concert and at the same time, uh, both scholars and practitioners working in concert. And third, that accelerates the impact of the work of the University of Chicago on not just scholarship as we've done for many years, but also practice. What do I mean by that? The way we're gonna do that is we're gonna build on a set of foundations that we've been building on in the university for the last several years. Uh, independent of that long-term tradition that you all know about, over the last few years, the University of Chicago has really embarked on some remarkable and I think historic interventions. One has been the Urban Education Institute that you know about. The Urban Education Institute has done some remarkable things. The University of Chicago, through the UEI, right now uh, hosts four campuses of its charter schools. These are four schools in the south side of Chicago, sponsored by the University of Chicago, where students are admitted on lottery from the local neighborhoods and given access to the world-class education that the University of Chicago should be able to provide. Now, what's interesting about these schools is that they're schools that are actively involved in the educational mission of the university, such that the research that's being conducted by our faculty is being implemented in the schools, and the schools themselves are a site for the development and advancement of research. Of course, if you think about the lab schools, it's an, it's an idea that's actually very consistent with how John Dewey started the lab school a generation, a, a, well, a couple of generations ago. What's interesting about the schools is that it's been a model that has involved research in a very serious way with some of our best faculty, but also practice in a very concrete way. And it's been a success. The last, uh, last year and the year before that, and I'll let Patrick and others correct me if I'm wrong, the last two graduating classes, these are children from the most disadvantaged, uh, most difficult, most high violent neighbors in Chicago, 100% of the students have gone on to, have been admitted to a four-year college on a scholarship, 100%, yeah, 100%, every last one of them. And the last two, it's a remarkable record. I, have not, I haven't seen anything like that almost anywhere. You know, what's interesting is lots of schools also don't have unionized teachers and also in the private sector and can't boast that level of success among the poorest students of the, exactly. You got it, yeah? <laughs> Necessary but not sufficient condition. The missing element was the University of Chicago. <laughs> no, but it's, I mean, it's, that's right. And so the question is, what, what other areas can the University of Chicago, through, again, never abandoning its goal for being the agenda setters in urban social science scholarship, uh, create a kind of work that has a broader impact on the world? I'll give you two more examples, and then since my six and a half minutes are almost up, I'll turn it over to Neil. Uh, Neil is going to probably going to talk a little bit about uh, the work on violence that's, being, that's taking place with some of the work in his faculty, so I won't mention too much about this. But violence is another area where, again, our faculty doing highly cutting edge, scientifically robust research have had an impact in how both practitioners and policymakers think about reducing violence in the city. I'll let Neil talk about that. I won't go too far into that. What we're hoping to do with this Institute for Urban Science and Practice is to take the proven successes of these models and generate a larger entity where in the areas where, <coughs> excuse me, the University of Chicago has expertise and is building expertise on the analysis of large scale data uh, through computational methods, on uh, the analysis of health, uh, the relationship between health and social behavior on the connection between neighborhood social services and well-being, generate an institute that encourages, again, this very, very, very high-level rigorous research in such a way that faculty and students and staff are incentivized to engage with the world in a more aggressive, more concrete, and I think more high-impact way than we've done in the past. That's very big picture. I'm gonna stop there because I wanna make sure we have time for uh, a, a conversation, for questions about unions. Uh, for some Q&A, and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Neil Goodwin. Okay, thank you, Dean Small. Um, it's, first of all, it's great to be able to talk with alums, the, the wider alumni community. We, uh, last year, the School of Social Service Administration moved our alumni weekend to the fall, so our students could sort of have a little bit more interaction with some of our alums. 
So uh, I, I tend to interact more with our own alums. I, are there any SSA alums here? Right, I didn't think so. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's not surprising because they'll all be coming in the fall. So it's uh, great to talk to the wider alumni community, but I have a feeling that many of you may not be so familiar um, with the School of Social Service Administration. We are that low black building. Oh, good, you do. That's great. Oh, you don't. Oh, well, let me tell you a little bit. <laughs> I, so my assumption was accurate, at least in a few cases. Okay, so uh, we're not just that low black uh, Mies Vandro building on the other side of the midway. We, uh, the School of Social Service Administration, as Matthew said in introduction, we're arguably either the oldest or the second oldest school of social work in the United States and the world. Uh, we are certainly the oldest professional school that takes and is deeply concerned with the hardest social problems and takes the toolbox of science to try to address those. So uh, there are other schools of social work. The profession of social work has oftentimes been about service directly, about serving those that are most vulnerable, those that are the most disenfranchised and so forth. But we're really the first school over a, over a century ago that really, and our, the founding mothers of the school, and the first dean of my school, was the first female dean of a graduate school in American higher education. Uh, that was Edith Abbott. Uh, and um, so she, in fact, Edith Abbott herself was a PhD in economics here at the University of Chicago. She came, led the school in its first years, and essentially said, we can't just go out there and do whatever we're doing and think it's going to do good. We have to bring hard science to bear to solve social problems. And that, that sort of imprint over a century ago is really what my school has been about ever since. We've been very deeply involved, especially in the city of Chicago, in the settlement houses, in the homeless shelters, in the domestic violence shelters, in the child welfare system, in juvenile justice, in the prisons, in the substance abuse clinics in the mental health clinics and so forth. Our students go out and actually provide over a quarter of a million hours of direct service to the most vulnerable citizens in the city of Chicago each and every year across about 600 of the leading nonprofits in the city. But the thing that's distinctive about the uh, SSA from typical social work is that we are, we are anchored historically, ethically, in trying to advance the most rigorous science, the most rigorous thinking to bear to make the, the, the most impactful benefit, uh, to deliver the most impactful benefit for those that are most vulnerable. So the other thing that's unique about my school, and I think this is where uh, I'm nicely included in this panel, is that my, the School of Social Service Administration, maybe because of my first dean, uh, was not a social worker by training, although she was very involved in the profession, of course, she was an economist by training, is, is in-house at SSA are faculty not just from social work, but from economics, sociology, political science, psychology, geography, public health, public policy, anthropology, and social work. So we have faculty that represent about a dozen different disciplines that are all trying to tackle issues of poverty, issues of violence, issues of substance abuse, homelessness, crime, and so forth. The most difficult problems in urban settings. And uh, so we're, we're very excited to be part of the broader opportunity. Uh, my faculty interact with social scientists frequently, as do our students. And as Dean Small mentioned, we're, we're helping to conceptualize uh, the university's uh, broader urban agenda. I think the, very nicely, and I'm very excited that President Zimmer uh, sees as a very high priority uh, for the university to more deeply engage, more deeply contribute to the advancement of the city of Chicago, to the advancement of urban areas around the world, not just locally, but as Dean Small said, urban is, rapid urbanization is taking place all over the world right now. And the University of Chicago can make, has positioned to make a historic uh, contribution in helping to understand the complexities of urban life, in helping to identify opportunities to advance 
life in cities, and uh, certainly from the agenda where I sit, from my perch, help to, to address some of the most intractable and deep problems in urban settings, not just in Chicago, but, but uh, beyond. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Dean Small gave the example of, of the Urban Education Institute. Uh, a couple of other examples who, that you may or may not have heard of. One has been quite, uh, appeared quite a bit in the media recently, which is the University of Chicago Crime Lab. Crime Lab is directed by Jens Ludwig, who is a faculty at my school, at the School of Social Service Administration, also at the Harris School of Public Policy. And what Crime Lab does, here's an example of how we can take the toolbox of science to address the most difficult social problems. So what Crime Lab does is they engage in gold standard, actually taken from medicine, randomized clinical trials. How, how do we determine whether a medication is effective or not? We randomly assign uh, an individual to receive either some kind of active medication or to get a placebo. We, by the randomization, we then even out all kinds of variability across the groups. And so if we see differences across those groups, then we say, ah, this medication actually has some impact, has some benefit. That's a, that's a, on the science side, that's the, sort of the gold standard of designing and testing out interventions that also then can be used for social interventions. So for example, Crime Lab went and released a request for uh, proposals for uh, interventions in the city that were promising but didn't have a hard science behind them in preventing violent crime, especially in the city. So here's an example of this is a pressing need in the city of Chicago, pressing need, pressing issue in urban areas around the United States. And from the RFP, that they, were, they uh, solicited um, program, promising programs from a variety of nonprofits in the city, youth, viol uh, sorry, youth guidance, along with World Sport, uh, youth guidance actually we've had a long-standing partnership with, had a program that's called Becoming a Man, which is sort of a mentoring program for young, young high schoolers that are at high risk for perpetrating violence. Mentoring, bringing them together, giving them some skills, helping the, to alter their trajectories away from violence. But there was no hard evidence. Does this work or not? You know, we're spending a lot of money, but how well does it work? So Jens's team layered on a science design, this randomized clinical trial design, and from pre-test, post-test, after the kids that were involved in the intervention, when compared against those that were not, uh, he observed a 44% reduction in violent rearrest rates for the kids that were involved in this program. So, uh, so we now have not only benefit to those kids that took part in the program, but we also now have knowledge that then can be built upon to extend our impact, to extend the efficacy, to extend what we can do to advancing uh, our uh, efforts at reducing the most difficult of problems, right? So, so now, and in fact, because of that particular study, not only has Mayor Emanuel added more money to that program, but President Obama himself is touting the program. Now, he would never would have known about this program without the hard evidence that demonstrated its efficacy, right? So we have a win-win-win because the kids benefit, the science, the knowledge base benefits, and public policy benefits, and therefore we all benefit, right? And we save money, by the way. So there was a cost analysis, and I think Jens' cost analysis, he's an economist, said for every dollar we spend on this program, we actually save, I think it's $30 if these kids were um, arrested and go, go to prison, right? So we save on the economic side as well. So that's an example of how we can uh, forge advances. That we, the institute concept that Mario is talking about is one that leverages some of these great new initiatives. We have a variety of, of initiatives like this that uh, we think can really sort of take uh, scholar, the great scholarship tradition at the University of Chicago 
and make even more uh, impactful and robust contributions to the life in the city and to urban uh, areas around the world. I think on that I'll stop and let hand off to Kate. Great. I, uh, well, I'm going to stand up anyway. So, uh, well, I'm actually going to head on over to the slides for me because I actually need some visual aids, I think, <laughs> to, uh, to better address these ideas of implementation and the idea of engagement with the city. Um, so the themes that Mario and Neil drew out today, I want to um, provide one example here, which is a few pictures from our Lakeside community. So I think we have to open a door, right? <laughs> the slides will magically appear. Great. That's exactly what I wanted. Um, going to make this, this is a different, I moved from a Mac to a PC, so I'm trying to, I think we'll be okay here. Um, so, so let me tell you, yeah, did, please lower the microphone. Oh, thank you, okay, thanks. How's that? Is that good? Great, thank you. Uh, so as I said, we want to really think about how one project in particular could draw on these concepts of sort of the history of the University of Chicago, I think our, um, our low walls notion, right, that we collaborate across disciplines, uh, the idea that we engage with the community around us. So I'm going to uh, just take a few minutes to describe the Lakeside community to you and talk about how some of these norms of the University of Chicago are, um, are emerging in the work that we um, are engaged in at Lakeside. So Lakeside, ha, who has heard of the Lakeside development? Just, oh, okay, so some large number of you. Oh, we did. Okay, great. Um, right, so there's a Lakeside community in Michigan on the lakefront. I'm not talking about that Lakeside. I'm talking about um, the U.S. Steel Southport site. It's, it's been vacant. It's, it's closed for about 20 years. It's approximately six, 600 acres, one square mile, and it's, a, it's nine miles south of the loop. It's about 79 to the Calumet River, um, and it is the one place along um, Lake Michigan Lakefront that is not, does not have open access to residents who are proximal. So that's an important part of what this uh, development will contribute. The plan is to develop residential and commercial space, approximately 17,000 households and likely 50,000 residents. Uh, there is a hope for retail and light industrial space and some early conversations right now uh, with the Urban Education Initiative about some uh, about the development of school on the site, some conversations with uh, the hospital administration here about the possibility for a satellite clinic. Uh, what what Lakeside will do is will connect south side of Lake Michigan, as I said. And right now, I don't know how many of you have driven down Lakeshore Drive, but um, Lakeshore Drive is being extended into Lakeside as, as a boulevard. And actually, my understanding is that should be done by the end of the month. So with that comes a turning point in the development of Lakeside, it also means that now $98 million in TIF money will be available um, to the developer. And so that means that there'll be a lot of action, we think, in the next year or two in terms of um, constructing the space. But the, the reason I wanted to turn to some slides is I think it's easier to describe it if you can actually see what I mean. Um, so I'm actually going to uh, quickly go to some images and I'll go back to that slide. This is um, what Lakeside looks like when you're standing on the ground. It is completely raised right now, uh, but it has, as you can see, a glorious view of, um, of our downtown. Uh, this is what Lakeside looked like 20 years ago. So this is what the um, U.S. Steel site looked like at the height of its operation. And this is what it looks like right from, the, from essentially the same vantage point today. As I said, it's raised. You can see it's, um, it's a lot of land. It's, a, it's a really a, a lovely location. And this is what the um, architects, Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, uh, together with the uh, developer McCaffrey, have, have um, come up with as a possibility for what this development might look like. As you can see, the, um, it's a mix of high and low rise, a mix of uh, residential and commercial, and um, even some boat slips for those who may be in need. Um, so, and I'll return to that point in a moment. Uh, so the notion is this uh, development with global significance, uh, international thinking for living differently, hoping to bring in actually some insights from Argonne and the Computation Institute about how we might think about issues like water reclamation and green technology, 
um, thinking about how it might transform the region, the city, the Southeast Lakefront in terms of um, uh, employment possibilities and commercial activity, uh, creating um, some kind of bustle on the, on the south side in some residential space, just akin to some of uh, the work of, of Jane Jacobs, who many urban sociologists turn to to think about how we create safe and active uh, residential space. Uh, and then finally, connecting Lakeside to the neighborhood and to neighboring Chicago. Um, so, so just to share with, uh, with you the development schedule, um, there is the hope right, that, the, um, that uh, Lakeshore Drive will really be completed um, by the end of this month. And then other uh, possible projects in the uh, short run would include this uh, public access to the lakefront, transit improvements, um, and other interim uses, and then hoping for retail to open in 2015, and then these other potential projects as I describe. I just wanted to go back a moment to really think about why, why is Lakeside important to us. Um, again, you know, for those of us who are interested in urban context and implying some of the ideas that, that uh, Neil and Mario raised earlier, this, this is unprecedented size and scope. We can't find another development of this type. We've turned to some, um, some examples in Beijing and in South Korea, but they are actually of a much smaller size than, than what we are entertaining here. Um, Neil talked about this notion of, of experiments that Jens Ludwig has been um, developing through SSA and the crime lab, and, and we see this as a possibility too, where we could think of randomly assigning certain kinds of design features throughout mm -hmm. Lakeside to think about what's most effective for the population. Um, but one of the things we think is most critical is this idea of ex uh, exploring segregation and integration, and, um, and I mean that to encompass economic, social, and commercial. Uh, I think what social scientists can bring is, is this possibility of really creating what we hope will be a synthetic community with the community that surrounds it. And right now this is our greatest mission and concern, is to think about a way that this becomes one large community and that um, the innovations that we see in Lakeside will have important effects for, for those um, contiguous neighborhoods. And um, I'll, I'll close by saying that we see this as an uncommon collaboration. Uh, internally, I'm, I've been working with physicists and computer scientists who last year, I have to say, I never knew. Um, and now I'm spending half my week with them. Um, but also, we are, we are collaborating with, um, with people from the city, uh, with people who are thinking about big questions related to big data. Um, Charlie Catlett has been leading urban CCD um, and is thinking about a project uh, called Lake Sim, where there'll be um, actual sort of experiment. You may want to talk about this a little bit later, but, but sort of real-time kinds of data tracking and, um, and accessible sorts of um, projects down there that you know, potentially kids can engage in to learn more about science and other. He's got a lot of really nice ideas. I don't know if that was raised in the last panel. Um, but we see it as, as a, a really wonderful opportunity both internally at the University of Chicago and externally as we, um, we hope become um, ever better neighbors to our city. So with that, I'll close. All right, so I guess uh, we're now opening up the floor. Yep, why don't we start here and then here. <laughs> First of all, most of our research, at least at, at my school, is a, 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 actually is focused on women and girls, no, more, the far girls more so. Are more because they become the next generation. Yeah, yeah. Right. Well, li listen. So I, sh you know, I have to turn to some of my colleagues who are experts in in teen pregnancy per se. So I can only say what I know as a somewhat educated a s scholar of social welfare generally, but not a, I'm not an expert in teen, teen pregnancy. So, uh, but, but I will say, for, first of all, teen pregnancy has hit, uh, uh, is actually at a new low 
from the last couple of decades has gone down actually rather remarkably and steadily over the last couple nationally. So that's a, sort of an interesting one that, that you'd, see, you'd see an advertise on the issue of teen pregnancy and it sounds like that advertise had a particular message. Um, and you know, that's, messages will take facts and do with them what they will. You know, that particular fact around uh, marriage promotion? No, it's about, the thing I focused on was school. Was on school? school. On school? And getting a job. Oh, right. Well, s certainly, yeah, if you're, right, so that's right. So I'm, there's, there's good evidence. And Mara, you sound like you want to chime in on this too. Well, You've yeah. done some studies actually. A little bit, to... yeah. So, the, so there, <coughs> There's, there's, a part, there's a part to the story that's probably not right, but there's a part that's probably right. So the part that's probably not right is that actually births to teen mothers have leveled off and actually declined a little bit. So in the 90s, there was a lot of conversation about this. They, they were climbing, and then they stopped climbing, and actually they even started declining. However, uh, births to unmarried mothers have continued to climb. And now that's a big issue. So to kind of put it in perspective, you might remember that in the 1960s, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, pointing to exactly the same issue, right, uh, wrote a major report called the, the Negro Family, A Case for National Action, and he argued that the Negro Family, this was the 60s, a case for national action. And what he argued, what he showed, and this was true, was that at the time about a third of all births among African American mothers were to unmarried mothers. The rate for whites was about 10%. And he thought this was a major emergency precisely for what you said, because mo regardless of any moral issues or personal opinions, the probability that you're going to be a poor household when you're a single parent household is much greater than if you are a dual parent household. Well, over the ensuing 40 years, the proportion of births to unmarried mothers among African Americans has shifted from 30% to 70%. 7 0. Mm -hmm. So today, seven of all 10 births among African Americans are to unmarried mothers. The proportion among whites has soared to about 40, 45%. It's, everybody has gone up. There's, there, it's been like an equal opportunity trend. <laughs> That's a great question. We actually only have begun knowing something precise about cohabitation in the last 10 years. So a lot of some proportion of unmarried mothers are cohabiting, but many actually are not even cohabiting, at least not stably cohabiting. If you want even more, it turns out that a lot of what's happening is that the dynamic of the family among low-income families has changed. So we remember we have a vivid image of the single parent mother, sort of one mother with two children or three children uh, from the same parent and the father left and the father was not around. And today really what there is a lot of, it's uh, cross race, um, is what the researchers have called multiple partner fertility, where really what you have is really households made up of, you know, a father who's there for a part of the time, but after three years they've split up. There's one kid from one father, another kid from another father, sometimes a grandmother, a lot of dynamism uh, but of course, uh, the reason you worry about that, separate again from your whatever your political beliefs is, is down the line, the probability of poverty for the kids is much greater. So in that part, I think, you see, so that's why I say this part that's actually not accurate, but there's another part that I think is kind of pointing to something that's important. I think in that part, I think there is something to think about. I would actually echo Neil in the point that there's actually quite a few people working on these issues uh, across the university from the mother slash parent perspective. I'm actually one of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, there was a hand here, and then a hand here, and then a hand here. Yes, so, um, so I, yeah, oh, I should, I'm sorry. So I, along with uh, my colleagues who have asked this question, 
do not know for certain. I do know that the developer has been in active conversations with a number of different employers to try to think about what kind of light industrial mm -hmm. space could be uh, developed at Lakeside. One example I will give you is that if, if you take, if you're able to drive down to Lakeside, right now some of it is closed off, but there, um, I believe it was the Sweetheart Cup Company who started to build um, manufacturing space there and then they bought out Prairie Packaging, I think. I, I may be inverting those, I'm not certain, but I, that's, um, that's my understanding. What remains from, from their early work are some roadways, some lighting, some, um, you know, they developed some physical structure down there that, um, that the current developer will use. But the only reason I share that is to say that somebody thought it was a good place <laughs> already to, uh, to make that choice and did make that choice. And then when this other opportunity became available, they bought Prairie Packaging instead of developing um, the lakeside. Uh, um, industrial space. But that does say to me that where one person goes, another may follow. And I think right now, um, you know, we're coming out of this recession, we believe. So, um, so I hope to see much more activity. But I know, but, but that's because more people are searching for jobs, right? Wasn't that the asterisk at the end of that story? I think so. Um, but in any event, uh, Ed Woodbury is the, is the key person um, through McCaffrey Interests, who is the um, the main person on the, developing, the developer side who is in these uh, discussions right now. Here's the hand over here. Well, Lakeside Property represented an ideal place to import huge quantities of material from around mm -hmm. the Lake region, and now you have late that ability to that. And if you consider the long term consequences of permanently uh, stopping. Yeah, I think that's a terrific question. I, what would be interesting to look at is, is what that activity looked like prior to uh, U.S. Steel closing. And since it has been um, dormant for 20 years, you know, what the possibilities would be like now, um, given changes in how we ship and distribute materials. Uh, it would also be interesting to look further south because some of those same kinds of entryways, I believe, are still open, at least relatively recently when I went down the front drive in Gary, but even a little bit north of Gary, you can see that there's still a fair amount of activity. Um, you know, so, I, so I think some of that either could be built or drawn out um, in, the, in the space that's already active in that way. But I think that's a great point. Yeah, so that, that's a great, a great, I guess a great two-part question. The first is uh, maybe, the, well, the second is, is that the way things are going? I, I would be surprised. Um, maybe I'll answer that one first. I'm not sure. Uh, I would not predict that over the future, disciplines are going to disappear in favor of institutes or centers that don't have a disciplinary basis. And part of the reason is that it is still the case that knowledge even though a lot of boundaries are becoming crossed, or cro boundaries are crossed, traditional disciplines are being crossed, and so on, um, disciplines do serve an important function, which is that they train graduate students and future scholars in a particular trade. 
Um, one of the things that we've been very careful in, th in terms of thinking about these institutes is to make sure that, for example, uh, if you're an economist or you're an anthropologist or you're a historian and you're a sociologist, you're learning very specific trades that you can really only learn from other historians or economists or sociologists or anthropologists. The best historian in the world is not going to do very good anthropology. The best sociologist is not going to do very good economic, economics. And so the question is, when you're creating a, so, so I, and I think that'll remain the case. And so, because I think that'll remain the case, uh, I doubt that we'll ever reach a point, I, well, ever. I doubt that over at least our generation, we'll reach a point where the disciplines will cease being necessary. Now, going back to the first question, which is more about whether, and I, tell me if I'm getting this right, is it a good idea uh, for there to be a heavy focus on institutes as opposed to on centers? I think, uh, it could be dangerous, but I think some things are actually quite good. The danger is first, in intellectually, whether you end up directing your work towards uh, kinds of work that are out there because that's where the resources are. Right? There's, somebody has to be doing basic research. With this, this place, of all places, we do the work that we think is important. I think the way to avoid that danger is to not launch or not engage in things that the faculty and the students aren't already interested in. Right? So in other words, there's lots of centers and institutes that we could imagine that could generate lots of money, but that nobody cares about. And if the faculty are interested in, if we, when we're doing our own research, aren't excited about it, no matter how much money, it's just not going to go anywhere. And the, the reason I'm confident about the urban issue is that we have quite a strong core of urbanists already doing their work right now, who even if they didn't get a single extra dime, we continue doing the work they're doing. They would just do it at a smaller scale and with a much lesser impact. So I think that's, that's the danger, but I think that's how we're avoiding it. Um, beyond that, I'll let others uh, speak if they have other thoughts on this issue. Uh, um, it's a great question, and I, I concur with Mario on 90% um, of, 95%. Uh, <laughs> he, earlier this morning, he emailed me saying, I agree with 90% of what you wrote here, but 10% can I change? So I'm just, I'm just nudging him back. <laughs> Um, but, um, and I think that uh, it's, re it's really interesting because my school in, in and of itself is multidisciplinary school, so that we sort of naturally like to think across disciplinary lines. Are they going to crumble? No, I agree with Mario. I think there, there is an essential rigor, depth. You know, the word is discipline, right? Because there's a disciplinary focus to sociology, to political science, to economics, and so forth, psychology, that is essential to complement emerging areas. U of C, in some ways, is, is, you know, like no other place in the world in the sense that we try to think beyond silos. And that is a wonderfully invigorating part of this university, that's this distinctive, that, that generates some of the most original scholarship anywhere and and so you, I think the, the reason I see some of the rise of the institutes is as complement to the disciplines not in competition to the disciplines because in like again like in my school an economist has certain strengths a psychologist has certain strengths a sociologist but if you pull that together in a around a shared agenda, a shared intellectual agenda, a shared real world agenda, then each of them can leverage the strengths of their discipline to, to generate even more comprehensive, more, more sophisticated ways of thinking. So to me, I see institutes as uh, essential, not only to counterbalance, sometimes to break down the disciplinary walls, but, but, but they're, you know, it's like a bicameral system. You can't have one without the other. And I think it's, it's really a vibrant strategy at, uh, that, that the university has chosen. I, I'm, I, on the other hand, yeah, you can pr proliferate too many institutes. You know, one can go so far. Thank you. 
City, oh, yeah. which I have to admit I never mm -hmm. played. And I'm curious about the use of things like those kinds of games in a wider population to try to get an idea of what could be important to people um, because, of course, they're expressing um, a, a preference by how they're designed. And that's the first thing. The second question is much more difficult. I come from the physical sciences, and I'd really like to hear a little bit more about how do you, in the social sciences, really carry out what I would call the hypothesis experiment testing that mm. I think of as science. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I'd be curious what thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, I'll take the easy one first. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I'll, take I'll take Sim I get Sim City. <laughs> yeah, I'll take that. These guys can have that other one. Um, yeah, actually, that's been raised in a number of contexts about the extent to which we could use some kind of format like that to think about what people's tastes are related to um, where, for instance, they might want a coffee shop versus a laundromat. Uh, versus a school versus a hospital. The idea that um, one would engage residents in actually helping to plan the city. And I don't know if either of you guys would want to talk about 1871 at all, but um, 1871 right, uses, um, is, is right now using data from the city of Chicago and developing, my understanding is there are a number of startups within this place, 1871, that's at the Merchandise Mart, where a number of people are gathering together to think about innovative ways to use data in a predictive capacity I'm not certain that anyone is doing anything that's SimCity-like, but if there is a place where people might be, I'm guessing it's there. And actually, Caroline has a comment uh, on that. They are actually, well, first of all, a new version of SimCity came out last year, so in case you're interested. Um, but also, the, um, there is some research coming out um, that might be where they're doing projects with um, having folks to actually play the game. So question two. <laughs> 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 and I can, and they know. Right? Yeah. What time is it? <laughs> Neil has uh, offered to let me start so that he can offer the definitive conclusion. Ninety percent of it. <laughs> no. Exactly. So um, the question, if I'm getting it right, is whether, um, no, it's how in the social sciences, when we're doing what we consider scientific work, are we doing hypothesis? testing, and uh, experimentation. Um, and going back. Yeah. So in some fields and in some ways, the process is actually very similar, meaning the fields proceed often very deductively. Somebody sits in their office and they say, hmm, I wonder if the reason people do A is because of causal factor X. Maybe I, you know, I think that the reason people don't do well in school is because they're not paid enough, they're not incentivized enough to do well in school. I don't think that. It's an example. So scientists often do this, and they do this all the time. They find a school that's willing to randomly assign students to a condition, whether you pay students or whatever, in, uh, institute your intervention, and randomly assign others where you don't. You might do it in one school district and another, another school district in, another, in one classroom and not another, or, or, and so on. And then you follow the students over time and you see what happens. I'm actually doing a version of that right now in my own research, for example. One of the things I was working on this morning is a project where we are working with parents attending Head Start centers, and the attendance rates are very low. And if the attendance rate is low, then the kids aren't really getting the exposure that you think you need for the kids to do well when they get into school, right? So it's not, they're not getting the dosage. So we think that a lot of the reason they're not getting, um, that the attendance is low is that they're not incentivized sufficiently to think of Head Start as a real thing like school as opposed to a not real thing like daycare. And so we're designing an experiment where it, we're in cooperation with an organization that runs multiple Head Start centers. We're going to, in some centers, create an incentive and not create it in others, and we're gonna follow the centers over time. That's pretty similar to a kind of a deductive model where you have an idea, you run an intervention and then you follow it over time to see what happens. Now, a lot of good work, I think, can happen that way. But I think the reason your question is interesting is that a lot of social science can't work that way. Mm -hmm. 
because, as, and this is not saying anything you don't know, unlike in the physical world where, you know, uh, water doesn't have a brain and can't decide what to do, or not to follow you, or, this, or has a willpower, or you don't have to worry about the ethics of paying or not paying water to show up a class, um, you just can't do that kind of work. And so the question is, what do you turn to? Well, it turns out that there's actually quite a few models that are actually even consistent with what's happening in other sciences. For example, um, a lot of evolutionary biology is not really experimental in the way we think about it. There's not somebody in a lab mixing things and seeing what happens. They're just looking at patterns from multiple different sources and deductively trying to come up with a story that explains them, right? Um, a lot of social science actually works that way. You look at basically observational data, you look at patterns mm -hmm. in the world and you try to make inferences, usually with some caution if you're any good. Um, if you're not cautious, typically our faculty or students will tell you where you're screwing up, but with some caution you try to make inferences on that basis. And that's a different kind of inference you can make from when you're making an experimental intervention or you're controlling everything, uh, but it's one way of doing it. Having said that, I'll say the third thing, which is, in spite of that, I actually do not necessarily subscribe to the idea, this is just personal opinion, that the gold standard for good science would be one model as opposed to the other. Mm -hmm. The reason is, even in the cases where you can control the experiment and you can do everything beautifully, you still have a controlled experiment. Right. You don't really know for sure that on the real world, the reason things are happening is because of the things that you happen to control. It's actually very hard to do that. Even in the best case scenario, right? You go and you find uh, a school district in Alabama that's willing to let you do your experiment. Well, now you know a lot about one school district in Alabama during the year that you're running your experiment with the students who happen to be there. Mm -hmm. You still have to be cautious. Mm -hmm. So that's my answer to your question. Sorry, we've run out of time. I can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing for a dean to do, right? Is sort of go around the. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, I'll try to. I'll try a response in a couple minutes because I don't want to use up the whole time. But, I mean, I, I concur with a hundred percent of what Dean <laughs> Mario says this time. Uh, and uh, I would say, right? I think essentially the, what comes to mind is really. I think the issue that you're raising is control of variables. That is that in the hard physical sciences, you can raise temperature and observe certain outcomes in a causal linear way, right? And if you can isolate the, the independent variable, it's the classic science model, then you can see what happens to the dependent variable. And whenever, when we're, I think actually the, the analogy to the biological sciences that Mario brought up is a really good one because in, in biological sciences, while we tend to think of them as hard sciences as well, there are multiple, multiple, multiple variables at multiple levels that are very, very hard to control. However, there are technologies where you can begin to isolate, you can control in a laboratory, right? Uh, the, the, the temperature, you can uh, make sure there are no contaminants, you can take out all the extraneous, what we call confounds, confounding variables, that can then sully inferences about causality. Right, and that goes to your point about correlation, and therefore, essentially, we're talking correlational understandings of the world, and we can never say A causes B in the social world. And probably, in fact, the reality is that's the case. We rarely, if ever, can say A causes B, that this particular intervention that I was talking about, the becoming a man intervention, actually caused the lower, right? At the same time, so what we do in, in, in social sciences and in social social services, social work, and so forth. Actually, the, 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 dri the drivers to pr human problems, for example, are so multifaceted, so multi-leveled, so interconnected, right? So actually, sometimes the causal processes are cyclical, self-reinforcing. You know, poverty causes what? Which causes poverty, which causes teen pregnancy, mm -hmm. which causes then, right? So then where do you figure out, how do you do, because you can't, you can't control an independent variable like pregnancy. I mean, you, right? 
So the, the, the control, it's really an issue of controlling of independent variables. And we have all kinds of techniques that we struggle with, to, uh, tools that we try to bring to bear, just like biological sciences bring to bear, that are research designs, that are statistical tools, that are theory tools. So the theories help to drive us you know, into certain variables and focus on certain variables. And therefore, then we layer on the most rigorous designs we feasibly can and ethically can. We're constantly dealing with ethical problems, right? Like I was just alluding to, you can't cause someone to be violent to someone else or to be homeless or to be a right. drug-injecting in person. I mean, it's just it's absurd. But you can watch. So essentially, yes, you can get toward causality in the social sciences, but you can never actually ever be there. But listen, you know, we make these decisions in the real world, the policy decisions, practice decisions that affect people's lives. That actually sometimes are life and death decisions. And so we have to push the limit of the science as we, far as we possibly can, as responsibly as we can, to make the most firm inferences we can, knowing that in fact we might be wrong, or we might be off base. But we have to act. I think we all act. We all make choices in every day, and we act with certain types of inference. We want to just, I think the social sciences are, can we just push that to a more scientific, in a more scientific direction? I can just give one quick example and then want Mario to jump in that. One of the things we're trying to fund right now is a social survey related to Lakeside so that uh, we can assess what the surrounding residents think about the development, what their aspirations might be, and also just get baseline data so we can assess change over time. And if we, unless we get those baseline data, we can't make any claim about the effect that this development had in the surrounding community. I mean, one of the arguments we make is that um, Social surveys are important because you hear the voices of everyone in the community. And so if we rely on people like key stakeholders, um, we, uh, we can't, that's a particular kind of voice and an empowered voice. And so we think that through this mechanism of social surveys, we're able to, to really get a sense of the whole community. The reason I use that as an example is to say that that's the kind of pitch I've been trying to make to funders <laughs> related to the lakeside development. Um, and I've been trying to do it through private sources because I can get funding more quickly, is my sense, than through NIH or other mechanisms, but I'm also going there. But it is a tremendous challenge, but that's, that's been the hook I've been trying to use. That, to me, is why social science is important, because we are able to systematically um, collect information in a way that we can't through any other mechanism. Those are voices that aren't heard otherwise. And so, yeah, please jump in on that, Maria. Yeah, I think that's, yes, well said. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, maybe it's a broad question, so I'll just give a, and we're out of time, so I'll give a very sort of brief, broad answer. For a project like the one we've been discussing, the, uh, the Institute, basically there's three main sources. Um, one is the federal government. The federal government has a lot of capacity. Um, at the same time, the federal government has a lot of requirements. And often, uh, federally funded grants are more conservative. I'm not talking politically, I'm talking intellectually. In other words, in terms of your ability to take very deep intellectual risks to do something that's not already conventional uh, than other kinds of grants for a number of reasons. Um, so that has an advantage, but important disadvantage. The second source is, of course, foundations. Uh, foundations, again, have their strengths and their weaknesses. The, the strength of a foundation is, of course, they tend to be more flexible. Um, uh, the weakness of going to a foundation is, of course, they tend to have pretty strong opinions about what they want to fund. 
And, yes. yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And so, you know, if your interest and your ambition and the way you want to take uh, the world or a project intellectually is consistent with the goals of a foundation, then it works beautifully. But if it doesn't, if you're taking a risk, you're doing something they don't happen to care about, then you have to find other sources. The third source are alumni and friends. Right, uh, private donors, the people who are, you know, believe in the kinds of work that take place at the University of Chicago. I think you all know that the kind of work that takes place here is different from the kind of work that takes place elsewhere. Uh, often it's more rigorous, often it's uh, much more concerned with the quality of the work itself than with other things. Um, and so for that reason, I think the third source that's been important for us is connecting to our alumni, connecting to our friends, connecting to our trustees, connecting to private donors who have an interest in taking a kind of risk that over the history of the university, uh, I think we've shown that taking risks in a, pay, in a place like this pays off. The risk that we've taken, this university is a big risk, right? A graduate-based university in which the college was in the foundation. I mean, everything about it, the lab school was a big risk. All of the big inspiring initiatives of this place have been play, initiatives where conventional sources are actually uh, not necessarily obvious, but where investing in them has paid off. So for us, that's been a big third one. And, and on that note, um, unless there are other questions, I'll thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Dean uh, Small, Guterman, and Professor Kegney uh, for such an exciting preview of what the university is moving to do in urban research and practice. And thank you for everyone who was able to join us uh, today. I also want to mention uh, that Jason Radford, uh, our graduate student in sociology, is going to be outside doing a demo of uh, social science computation. Uh, so you can see some of that. And our panelists will also be here if you'd like to answer any more questions. You'll also be getting a survey about this session and other uh, sessions that you participated in for Alumni Weekend. We encourage you to uh, complete that information so we can uh, continue to improve our programming. We hope you have a wonderful weekend and we thank you again. Again, applause for our panelists. Thank you. Yeah.